Good evening, everyone. Uh, I call to order the 11 June 2018 meeting of the Victoria City Council. Uh, first order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, uh, Doug, uh, Council, uh, any changes to the agenda? Doug, any changes? Council, any changes to the agenda? I move we adopt the agenda. Is there a second? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, the uh, motion passes unanimously. Next item, open forum. Uh, anybody can address the Council? Is there anybody at this point that would like to address the Council? Uh, I have no slip, seen none. Uh, nothing on the open forum. Uh, next item is the consent agenda. The uh, Doug, uh, Council, anybody want to pull anything off the consent agenda? Anybody in the audience wants to pull anything off the consent agenda? You may. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, that motion passes unanimously. The agenda, uh, consent agenda is adopted. First uh, order of business, uh, visitor presentation. Uh, Doug, do you want to give a quick intro, or should we just ask Jenny up? I think we have Jenny up here. She's, there she is. Uh, Jenny uh, Boderka. You got it. Ah. Uh, okay. Thank you. uh, you're welcome. Please, uh, for the record, when you get to the mic, introduce yourself and your position. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me here this evening. My name is Jenny Badurka. I'm the coordinator for youth and adult programs with Minnetonka Community Ed, here to speak with you this evening about Tour de Tonka. So thank you, Council and Mayor, for the opportunity to be here to speak tonight. Um, we always enjoy the opportunity to visit the cities where Tour de Tonka travels through uh, to tell them a little bit about what happened last year and what is to come for the year ahead. So we start, we'll start like we did last year, a little bit of by the numbers. Um, 24 communities will be traveled through in Tour de Tonka in 2018. Um, we have 616 volunteers that supported the event in 2017. So it really takes a huge group of people, staff, and volunteers to make it happen. Uh, 88 is the age of our oldest rider from last year. Um, and, and a little later, I'll tell you our youngest, a nice group, uh, nice big age group span. Um, 22235 is the amount of money that we spend working with police, fire, um, security guards to make sure that our um, routes that we travel are secure. Uh, we also spend $11,954 on all of the food uh, that we provide at our different rest stops that we have along the route. We work with 108 different agencies, cities, police, fire, um, different organizations to put the event on. Um, and so far, we've had 42 states participate in the 12 years of Tour de Tonka. So uh, volunteers, as I said, we had over 600. So we always need volunteers. If anyone is interested to volunteer even an hour of time, um, it could be helping registration. Um, directing a corner um, or helping at a rest stop, serving food, interacting with the riders. Um, visit our website, uh, www.tourdetonka.org. You can also register there as well. Um, a little bit about the distances and participation from last year. Um, we had seven ride options for families from 16 miles all the way up to 100. And as you can see, the 48 and the 100 mile options were our most popular with over 700 riders in each of those. Um, we had just short of 3,500 riders last year and that's been a fairly consistent number that we've been um, having each year. Um, our riders came from 166 different communities, 40 counties, 25 states, uh, and two countries last year. So this map here um, is 2017 riders from the U.S. And in our 12-year history, those in red are those that we're still looking to find to come to Minnesota and ride in the Tour de Tonka. So if you know anyone who lives in any of those states, uh, we appreciate your help in uh, recruiting them here for Tour de Tonka. Um, we always like to look a little bit at the um, top uh, 40 different communities and the number of riders that come from each of those communities. 
and you'll see Victoria's number 17 and flat from 2016. So um, 46 riders and uh, that's a nice showing from Victoria. This is 21 through 40. Okay, demographics very similar to what I shared with you last year that 30 to 50 age group is our most popular. Um, of participation and then it's still 60% men and 40% women. Uh, we do partner with the ICA Food Shelf in our community to, um, as a beneficiary of Tour de Tonka, so a portion of the riders participation fee and then also other donations that we collect. Um, we're proud to say we've raised over $60,000 for the ICA um, in our 12 years of Tour de Tonka. These are the cities that we will travel through for Tour de Tonka. And um, we work with a lot of police and fire departments, as I said, to secure some of those major corners. We also work with State Patrol and um, Carver County Sheriff. So a lot of great people that helps uh, make this event a su safe and success each year. For 2018, we will uh, have eight ride options for participants, and I'll read those to you. There's the 16 mile, 30 miles, 36, 48, 57, 62, 71, and 100. So um, each of them are a little bit different. If you go on our website, you can learn more about, you know, are they more on the trails or on the roads, um, and kind of find what's good for you. But lots of families in our 16 mile, you know, bringing kids along on their burlies, so lots of um, variety. And this is our big map um, with, it's a little confusing to look at initially, but all the different distances are mapped out on here. I think there's over 400 miles of road if you were to add everything up, um, all of the places we go. And um, depending on the distance you choose, you can go anywhere. Everyone will start and finish in Minnetonka, but um, you can be anywhere from Delano to Watertown to um, Waconia, get a nice scenic tour of the West Metro. As I mentioned along the way, we have some rest stops. So this year we'll have 13 of them. Um, and e at each of those is a DJ or a band, some kind of entertainment. We'll have a bike mechanic to help the riders that may need that. Um, a lot of great volunteers just to cheer people on and a lot of different food options along the way to keep them going. We do have some great sponsors who've been with us a long time. Um, so just like to thank Tonka Bay Marina, Domino's, Maple Grove Cycle, Bridgewater Bank, Park Dental, Boyer Building Corporation, Subaru, Cub Minnetonka, Invicta, and then we also do have two safety sponsors, which are Twin Cities Orthopedics and North Memorial Health. Um, this is a cool shirt. kind of a drawing of the shirt this year. Kind of looks like a bike jersey. Um, so we have a men's and a women's cut in those. Um, the participants will get those. Um, and all volunteers will get a t-shirt as well. Look a little bit different, but similar style. And then all of our riders and volunteers will also get a gift, which is a baseball cap from um, Invicta, who's kind of sponsoring that gift this year. Last year, someone mentioned the sunglasses. Those were a sponsorship with Subaru last year. So this year will be the hats. We don't have them in yet. So tonight we brought you guys some pop sockets for your phones, your cell phones. Um, and then just a little recap is a couple of slides of photos from last year. We did another beautiful day, hoping for another one this year. Um, and we have three different ride starts uh, now because we've gotten so big. So our 100 milers start out of Clear Springs Elementary. We have um, a couple, two distances that start out of the Minnetonka Community Education Center. Others start out of the high school and then everyone finishes for a fun, festive atmosphere at the high school. So we hope that we will see you all there on August 4th as either a volunteer or a participant. And I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Great event. Thank you. The council? Yes. No questions. All right. Thank well, you. thank you so much for your time. You have a great night. Thank, thank you. You, you too. Uh, next item. Uh, Kelly, would you like to introduce uh, Andy Berg? Uh, sure. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Tonight we have uh, Andy Berg from Abdo Ekin Myers. He's here to give a presentation of the 2017 audit. So with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, again, Andy Berg with Abdoika Myers, a partner on the audit. 
Um, last month in May, we met with the Finance Committee to go over the draft reports in a little more detail. I'll give a summary of the audit results and financial information during the year. So the 2017 results, our responsibility is, is we issue a, an opinion on your financial statement. We should have unmodified opinion, uh, which is the best opinion you can get. Uh, no audit findings to report. And also as part of the audit, we issue a report on Minnesota legal compliance. There's seven different areas. Uh, that we test for that and no findings there too so clean report so one uh, congratulations for the 2016 financial statement you received a financial award from GFOA uh, the city is gonna submit the 2017 financial statements again for that so I'd expect that you receive that award again so congratulations on that so getting into some of the numbers so I'll go through each of the funds a summary information Starting with the general fund, so the first graph here I have is the, a summary of the ending unassigned fund balance in the general fund. We compare that to the next year's budget. You can see the budget is a red line increasing over the five years uh, presented. The fund balance has been at about 30% over the five years internally of a, a fund balance policy to maintain the unassigned fund balance at that 30%. So with the increasing budget, you've been able to maintain the ending fund balance within your policy. If we look at the, the operations of the general fund during the year compared to budget, you'll see revenues came in at just under 4.9 million, above budget by about 588,000. The main um, area there is in licenses and permits, mainly related to the, the growth in the city. Expenditures real close to budget, uh, coming in in total at just under 3.9 million. Uh, with a $9,000 variance. He transferred out 463000 to other city funds for a total increase in the general fund balance of 524000 On the next slide, we look at the, the revenues over a three-year period by source. Just pointing out a couple things here. Um, you can see overall they've increased each of the three years, which correlates with the increase in the budget. The main revenue source, as you know, is your property taxes, the blue bar, which was about 68% of your total uh, revenue in the general fund for 2017. Um, and then the other item to point out is the, the red bar, the licenses and permits. You can see that um, increase each of the three years there to mainly growth related. Similar graph, but with the expenditures, just like with the, the revenues, you'll see the trend over the three years is um, increasing, which correlates with the increase in the, the budget. Pointing out a couple of the, the larger areas where the spending happens, general government, the blue bar, made up about 32% in 2017, and the public safety, the red bar, about 25% in 2017. So overall, the, the mix of the, the expenditures remain consistent over the, the three years. Now moving on to the city special revenue funds. You do have four special revenue funds. Uh, total ending fund balance at just under 1.2 million, which is about a $44,000 increase from 2016. The largest fund here is your Victoria Recreation Center, which increased about 22,000. Uh, mainly due to expenditures coming in below budget. The next slide uh, looks at the, your debt service funds and your governmental funds, so the, the debt, um, all the debt except the debt and the enterprise funds. So at the end of the year, you had about 22 uh, million of bonds outstanding. Within the debt funds, you had total assets accumulated of about 5.6 million. Uh, if you look at the, the interest payments scheduled over the year, total interest, if no bonds are refunded, about $2.5 These bonds are being paid back with a combination of taxes, assessments, and transfers. So there we just recommend the city continue to analyze the cash flow of the debt service funds to ensure that you're going to make the principal and interest payments. We do give you a 10-year history of the upcoming principal and interest payments. So that gives you an idea of the debt service requirements. If no new debt is issued, you can see that um, decreases as some of the bonds mature. The city also has a, a debt management policy and you're in compliance with that policy too. You do have a number of different capital project funds. So these are the funds where, you know, some of your bigger projects, street projects, uh, TIP districts are in the, these funds too. In total, you have just over $7 million of ending fund balance, which was an increase of about 765000 
from 2017. Now, if you look at the classification of that 7 million of Indian fund balance, about 44% is restricted from external sources such as the TIF funds, park dedication fees, and other certain restrictions. Internally, you have assigned about 52% of that uh, for specific items and committed about 4%. So of the total, like I mentioned, about 44% or just over 3 million is, can only be spent on certain um, items and is restricted from outside the city. Now moving on to your enterprise funds with the, the water fund starting, here's a cash flow from operations graph. Um, over the last four years presented here, you have generated cash from operations. So looking at the blue bar compared to the, the gray bar, so the blues the receipts, the grays the disbursements. Uh, the cash generated from operations had, has covered a, a portion of the debt service requirements, the green, and then you also have connection fees that you have collected um, each of the years. So with that added on, you've, you've generated um, cash in the water fund. Now, if we look at the fund balance or the cash balance, you can see that's increased uh, each of the last three years, ending at about 2.4 million due to that cash generated from operations and the connection fees. Water fund does have bonds outstanding, which have decreased each of the last four years as you've been paying down on those bonds, um, with ending bonds payable around 4.5 million at the end of the year. Looking at the sewer cash generated from operations, you can see here you have generated cash from operations, the blue bar higher than the gray bar, the disbursements, um, each of the, the years presented there with the exception of 2015. Um, you've also had connection fees that you've collected the, the purple portion of the bar, which has allowed the cash to increase, which you can see in 2017 really did increase, and you can see that in the ending cash balance when we look at this slide increasing up to 1.4 million from about 500,000 in 2016. You do have a stormwater fund. This fund did have cash generated from operations in 2017 due to the, the receipts increasing over the previous years and the disbursements going down in 2015 and 2016, you did use cash from operations in those years. So if we look at the, the ending cash, you can see that was on a decreasing trend from 2014 down to 2016. Remained stable in 2017. Um, even though you did generate cash from operations, there was some capital acquisitions in there that um, you used some cash for those. Now the next uh, three graphs, we do have a, a number of different ratio analysis in the management letter. Um, here we're giving you a comparison of other cities some in the population range of 2,500 to 10,000, which is the red bar. Cities in the population of 10 to 20,000 is the blue bar. So the first one here is looking at the debt per capita. There are two lines that represent the city of Victoria. The black line is the total debt. The purple line is the debt, including um, escrow debt. So at the end of 2016, you, you did issue some refunding bonds, those refunded bonds. Both the refunding and refunded were reported on the books uh, and refunded in 2017, so you'll see those two lines coming together. Otherwise, fairly consistent over the four years presented. Now, the next one is um, taxes per capita. You can see right in line with the, the peer group average and decreasing in 2017. And then the last one, looking at the governmental current expenditures per capita, you can see the city, the black line's been real consistent over the four years presented, and also below the, the peer group average. So as we saw in the, the general fund, the, the total expenditures going up uh, with the growth in the city, but maintaining the expenditures per capita um, even over that same period of time. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Council, are there any <clears throat> any places in the um, in the overall audit that you feel require any additional oversight or are in any way um, would benefit from 
or in non-compliant, I guess I should say, with any generally accepted practices, government, private practice, anything that would tell you there's a, um, a gap there in our oversight ability? Um, like I started out on the, the front page, no audit finding, so there's nothing that, that we saw would rise to the level that gets reported as a finding. We do issue a report on the, the Minnesota legal compliance of seven different areas. So, no, I'd, we don't see any, any areas that we would see that would elevate to a, a finding from that perspective. As part of the, the audit, we don't test the, the city's internal controls. We do gain an understanding to help plan the audit, but we don't test and give an opinion on the internal controls. How about, um, thank you, uh, how about trend-wise? Is there anything, I think you've been involved in our audits for a number of years now. Trend-wise, are you uh, feeling that the, there's anything that's moving in the wrong direction or conversely moving in a positive direction that you know you'd like to draw attention to well, I think a couple of the items that I pointed out you know maintaining the the general fund balance at your policy the 30 percent you know with the the growing budget and growing city I think that's positive I think that the enterprise funds cash flows you know are looking good and then those the the ratios we saw at the end so i think all the you know the numbers are uh, pretty positive the the capital funds you have a number of different capital funds with you know a, a, all that the ending fund balance that's assigned for future projects i think the city does a, a good job planning for the future and you know updating its financial management plan you know we do work with some cities that that don't even have one so Thank you. Uh, I've got a couple of questions for you. Um, the I want to simplify this because I don't want to get into all of the uh, audit procedures, but um, uh, you look at the final report that comes out, and I think you just mentioned a moment ago, you don't look at the actual controls that end up creating the report. You're not hired or that's not part of the audit as far as verifying that those controls are sufficient. Is that an accurate description? I think it's um, somewhat ac accurate. Like I mentioned, we, we look at the internal controls and gain an understanding for them, but we are not testing them, like you mentioned. So you're not actually independently verifying that those controls are suffi sufficient, and really what you're doing is you're verifying the report that comes out of that meets the auditing standards. Um, is that accurate? And the report you're talking about, the, the actual financial statements? Right, the financial yeah. statements. Yep. So... Um, is that typical? Uh, I would think that you would want to verify the controls that produce those financial statements to ensure that those financial statements are, are complete and accurate. Um, uh, could you comment on that? Is that something that's not typically done? Well, we do, you know, like we're not issuing an opinion on the, the controls or, or testing them. We do do walkthroughs and we look at some of the controls. We look at the policies the, the city has in place. You know, a number of our cities this size or smaller, we'll see some segregation of duties issues. We'll see some um, financial statement preparation findings where since we're in there doing the audit and preparing the financial statements, you know, here we, we evaluate, evaluate the, the city staff's ability to, you know, review and approve the draft financial statements. So in typical cities, though, would you uh, be required to provide an opinion on the controls that produce the financial reports? No. It, is that just not a common practice in government accounting or? Well, it's not part of a, a financial statement on it typically, especially in the, the cities we work with and, you know, a number of other firms that I'm aware of, I haven't seen that. Uh, so that's not a typical practice then? Correct. Okay, that, that's different than some of the audits I've been involved with. That's rather interesting. So uh, on that point, I know that there were some changes made based on some conversations in the, in the uh, finance committee meeting. Um, and I understand that uh, just because you have a finding doesn't mean it's an issue or qualifies a report um, because of the material nature or, or the, the, the basics of it. I didn't see in the, in the documents any mention of those changes that were made as part of this year's audit. Can you just speak to that briefly? Is it in there and I missed it, or is that... Uh, what, what changes are you referring to? Uh, uh, Kelly Grinnell, uh, when we talked, for example, one of the things we talked about were some procedural changes made related to how, how payroll gets processed mm -hmm. to ensure 
Uh, my concern is is the concept of the separation of duties uh, to make sure you don't have somebody that could uh, control the process from end to end. Um, and so I just asked some questions, and I understand some changes were made. Wouldn't that be something that would typically be noted, even if it's not a finding that, hey, uh, some adjustments were made? The adjustments in, in your policy and the procedures, no, I don't, I don't think that would show up in here. Now, if, if previous years we had a segregation of duties finding and the city made some changes to correct that and we eliminated that finding, then that would be commented on in there. Okay. You know, like we talked about in the, the finance committee meeting, it's, you know, there's, you may not have 100% segregation of duties in every single process and uh, but there are enough segregations that we don't see that rising to to a finding with all the other controls that you have in place so there. it's a judgment call that you don't think it gets to the level of a finding uh, which auditors do all the time in, Correct. in audits okay um, uh, one of the things that we did talk about uh, I asked you specifically about uh, signing authority for Kelly Grinnell and if I understand it uh, correctly, you told me that it, uh, I believe your words or something along the lines is that would make improvements if that signature authority was removed. Um, uh, can you say, could you please explain that? Say, do I have that right? Would you agree with that? And if so, shouldn't that be noted someplace? If she was removed as a signer, I think it would um, make the segre it would improve the segregation of duties. I think there's enough other controls that I don't think that that rises to a level of a finding in the audit, in our opinion. Um, I don't think that would need to be noted in, in the audit either. But you do think it would improve separation of duties? I think it would, yes, like I mentioned. In so the, would you recommend that we make that change? I think you got to analyze the whole process. I don't think you want to look at one single process and, it, you know, factor in internal controls, factor in efficiency, factor in cost benefit, and, you know, the whole picture versus looking at one one so, item, but that's where, you know, with the city, I think it's, we always recommend you annually look at your controls, look at your policies. You know, it's always good practice to do that and see where you can improve and make changes. Um, doing your own risk assessment where you see that, you know, items could happen and, you know, looking at those and, you know, are there certain areas that we can change? So I have some familiarity with audits, different types of audits, not financial audits. But for the average person out there listening to, the, to us, I hear you say that there's some improvements that could be made. You don't actually provide an opinion because that's not typically done uh, on those controls, but yet you provide a report on the financial reports that come out of that process. That seems to me to be we're kind of missing a, a, a key point here, and that is shouldn't we be looking for separation of duties and shouldn't we be looking for – the controls that produce those reports to make sure that those reports uh, have the least amount of risk. And as the financial auditor, don't you have that expertise where as council members or staff aren't the auditors and wouldn't we look for you to provide that kind of input? So I'm, I'm somewhat um, surprised, if you will, that the city should be looking at that when the financial auditors, this is what you do for a living, you guys wouldn't look at that. Could you kind of uh, well, like I said, we we look at it and gain understanding of it. We don't test it and issue an opinion on the internal controls. I think it's a responsibility of the city to create and ma maintain the controls. The auditors aren't part of um, internal controls. If we did see something that we thought was a uh, significant deficiency or material weakness, we'd definitely report that and have that discussion. You know, we have a number of city audits typically the the smaller ones where we do report the segregation of duties finding because they do have just one person in a lot of cases doing everything right but in our case we we have a bigger staff than you know a, a one person mm -hmm. shop in some of the smaller cities and i'm sure our staff is smaller than say a city of the size of Minnetonka or St. Louis right. Park or some yeah. other larger city. So, uh, it, it, you know, I understand, I appreciate the input. It just seems to me that there's a gap there that we would look for a, a, an expert to provide us some of that input on the design of our controls and, and whether or not those controls are implemented and operating effectively and not just the end result that comes out of going through that process and going through those controls. So, and I understand if, if you were not... Uh, uh, if that wasn't part of the contract or this is not 
uh, typically done. Is it something that's done maybe in larger cities and we're just too small for looking at those internal controls and actually testing them? Well, there, I mean, there could be some where there's a whole set of auditing standards that all auditors follow, whether doing city or business mm. for a financial statement audit. And, you know, part of that's assessing risks and you could, um, you could test internal controls to reduce your testing in other areas. Typically in our cities, we're just gaining that understanding and doing walkthroughs of the controls and we're not in there testing the internal controls and Mr. giving Berger, an opinion your opinion on it. Is that your, does your, does your organization test internal controls or you, we've contracted with you for a certain amount of services. We're not contracting with you for testing internal controls. Is that a business you support? Or if that was something we wanted to pursue, we'd have to go to another consultant. Um, that's possibly something we could do. Okay. I know we do some of those type of audits on the business side. We haven't done an actual test of internal controls. On the city side, we do do, we have a consulting side of our business where we go in and do um, process evaluations for cities, for counties, where we're not just looking at controls. And I don't say we're necessarily testing them there either. We're looking at uh, the processes as a whole, which will include internal controls and give recommendations on that too. I also understand that it's more of a statement than a question, but just verify my understanding that, that there is a uh, really hard line between the consulting services and the audit services coming from the same firm and we have a whole bunch of different consulting companies that have been split out from audit firms because of the potential conflicts of interest are providing consulting when they're doing audits. And so it might not be in the best interests of our organization to seek out consulting opinions on controls when you're also providing the audit opinion. Yeah. There's there's certain things depending on what, what the the project would be that we, we definitely take that serious and look at that when we're engaging in our on the consulting side of our business. Thank you. But you can have audit services that actually perform an audit of the financial controls different than consultants that come in and make recommendations on changes. I think those are two different sets of services, and Councilmember Crowley is correct that you can't uh, my understanding is you can't hire a firm to do consulting, make recommendations, and then use the same firm to come in and audit the recommendations that that same firm made. Uh, that's where you get into some uh, issues. But as far as a specific audit itself, I would think agreed upon procedures or there's other financial audit reports that could be used in SSA um, uh, or a SAS 70, for example, that would look at the city's uh, financial controls specifically and provide an opinion on that. Yeah, so, yeah if there I, were an agreed upon procedures engagement and an audit, we'd be able to do both those because you have to be independent to both of them. Got it. We've so, done I, certain engagements like that with other cities. All right, I appreciate that. Uh, we've talked about that. Uh, because this, this concept of scope came up, I'd like to ask you one other question. Uh, there's been two different times where the city attorney has referenced that your firm has provided an opinion as far as the city's payment of the legal fees. Uh, and it's been referenced or implied in those letters, at least how I read it, that your firm did provide an opinion. But when I looked at the engagement letter, I didn't see anything where your firm has actually been hired to provide that opinion. You're obviously not a, a legal firm. You're a financial accounting firm. Um, so uh, can, you, uh, uh, can you explain to me what, what your firm said in, as far as the payment of the legal fees and, and what sort of advice you provide to the city specific to that point? I don't uh, believe we provided any specific advice regarding the legal fees, and I talked to the, the city attorney about both those. You know, we had a conversation, I mm -hmm. think, um, and you can add um, Mr. Vosier your comments to that, too. I think there were conversations, like the attorney general one, that was the, the general conversations we had through the, the audit process. So. We did not issue any opinion on the, the payment of legal All right, so it's, it's fair to say that you did not provide any, you, you're obviously, again, you're not a legal firm. You didn't provide a legal opinion. Um, you didn't provide a, uh, you weren't hired to and you didn't provide a specific opinion as to whether the city should or should not pay those legal fees. Is Correct. that accurate? Okay. Can we uh, just I have a couple back questions. Up. Yep, we go ahead. Go and, and then circle back. I'm, a, I'm afraid we're going to be done with this conversation and, uh, well, said nothing. Um, 
Let's, I'm just trying to get some perspective here. You said that, that Victoria does not have a segregation of duties issue. That is, has not, never been brought up as a uh, deficiency or a material weakness in an audit or any kind of uh, issue. Is that true? Not the the last few that we've done, and I believe that from before us didn't have that in so there either. What, what's that, that take about 10 years? If you take all the audits you did and all the audits the previous firm did, what is that, about nine or 10 audits? Yeah, I think we, this is our fifth one since you switched to okay, us. Okay, so there's been they about were 10 audits. Six years. There's been about 10 audits and segregation of duties uh, hasn't popped up. So it, I can tell you uh, in the public sector, before I retired, I was a controller for a company that was almost a billion dollars. And uh, I was a controller and my name was on the paycheck. So, um, you know, the segregation of duties related to payroll doesn't necessarily mean that the director of finance can't sign checks. Therefore, ergo, it's never been brought up as a segregation of duties issue. It's something that uh, you could say, yes, would it, would it be good? Would it look good? And you, the answer is affirmative, yeah, you, sure. But this is a small uh, establishment uh, and there's certain efficiencies needed and so on and so forth. And there's other controls that, that come into play. Uh, the other thing I wanna ask you about, uh, the opinion uh, that you issue, the statement in it says, the auditor considers internal control relevant to the city's preparation and fair presentation of financial statements in order to design audit procedures that are appropriate in the circumstances, but not for the purpose of expressing an opinion on the effectiveness of the city's internal control. How does that statement differ from a statement on an opinion for an audit of a corporation? I think if, it, if it's given a audit opinion on generally accepted auditing standards, I think it, it's the same. Yes, it's, a, it's almost identical. That's my point. So this is, this is standard procedure. And basically, if you're uh, looking at controls to, in order to design audit procedures, you are, in effect, there is a de facto assessment going on or you wouldn't be doing it and you wouldn't have rigorous audit procedures if you didn't, if you were slapped in the face with a, a gross internal control inconsistency, that would be flagged immediately. And uh, it would be part of your process and part of your write-up, is that true? That's true and I think that mirrors what I said where we're gaining an understanding right. the, of the internal controls. Right. And, so but even not though you're not opinion. doing a, a, thir a complete A to Z internal control audit of the city, the process you go through looks at the basic internal controls that are necessary to prepare accurate financial statements. And in looking at those controls, you will have to do some kind of an assessment uh, as to the adequacy of those controls or you will not proceed with your audit. Is it, I'm, I'm not saying anything incorrect here, am I? I think that's correct or we would proceed and do different procedures and we would have an internal control finding. Right. Now in the process of being on the uh, uh, finance committee for uh, four years, or, I came across a uh, series of uh, worksheets, spreadsheets about this thick that were entitled internal control questionnaire. Uh, so were those questionnaires coming from the finance department or coming from the auditors or uh, what, Kelly, do you remember such a thing? Uh, there is an internal control matrix that, matrix. The, that the auditor um, put together and then we review that to Okay, there's an intro, and it's a fairly, if I remember this thing, it was multiple pages, like 10 or 12 pages, a uh, huge spreadsheet with many, many different items uh, that were being looked at. So that exists, right? Um, yes. Is it, was that an audit tool coming from the, the auditors, the internal auditors? 
Um, Andy, I don't you... know this from us, but we, and I think the finance committee has seen the internal control matrix that, that we use to, you know, help gain our understanding of each major transaction cycle, whether it's payroll disbursements. Exactly, receipts. exactly. We we do, you know, look at all the the not just the segregation of duties. We look at the control environment, monitoring, you know, all those areas too. Again, exactly. To help plan the the audit. So in order to do a certified audit, even though you're not doing a a rigorous bone, uh, you know, A to Z internal control audit, the intrinsic principles of auditing to gain opinion and to uh, give an opinion on our financial statements include quite a bit of rigor as far as internal controls are concerned. You don't ignore them. And it's, uh, but basically you uh, say to the public, in your opinion, I didn't look at every, under every rock, and uh, therefore we give no opinions uh, on internal control. Uh, my point is that there is a rigorous internal control discipline that is going on with every, each and every certified audit inherent in your audit process. Am I taking words out of your mouth, or am I saying something incorrect? I think I think you're saying saying it correctly. That yeah, I mean we're in there looking at them again to understand them, not to issue an opinion on them. Okay, thank you. A uh, couple other little questions. Uh, I noticed on the sewer fund uh, on one of your slides, it jumped up from nine hundred thousand to one point four million. What is there a is there a simple explanation for that? I think that the biggest piece, if you look here at the the combination of the blue and the the purple, I think the the connection fees was the the biggest contributor to that increase in the the cash balance. And Kelly, I don't know if you want to add anything is further that to that. Complex? Uh, that is part of it. And then the other thing we did in 2017 is we began charging a sewer availability fee. We had previously just been collecting a water availability fee. Mm. In 2017, we split that out so that it would be going into the sewer fund also. So we feel that kind of fund level is necessary? Is that and justified? Is that true? It must be true. I think so, given the um, potential for... Um, uh, development south of the city, um, like the Wasserman um, improvements, we we had to front the money to put that infrastructure in. So I could see that happening again, where it would be good to have the money on hand if we needed to okay. do that again. So we were very prudent with our sewer fund, with our. But if we look at the stormwater fund, can you put that up there? Uh, the the one with the dollars, yeah. So. Uh, we've got about 350000 and uh, we have not increased that. As a matter of fact, that's less than it was five years ago, four years ago. Um, and we have, what, 85 or 90 stormwater ponds? Yes. Getting an affirmative. Okay. And those star stormwater ponds uh, are getting older and older and uh, filling up with... Uh, stuff and they they have to be inspected they will have to be inspected rigorously and they will have to be dredged in some cases um it just seems that and this is an old subject um it just seems that we are uh, we've taken a very prudent view of our sewer fund but a very strange view of our uh stormwater fund so uh, I don't know how that plays in the audit because you're just looking at a fund, a, a bunch of cash that's sitting there. But that cash is supposed to be doing something. It's supposed to be helping the city in the future and protecting us, giving us some leverage for some of the things that are going to happen. And uh, when I say that I think that's inadequate, I'm not the first one to say that. But I, w I want to get on the record again that we've got to uh, start building this stormwater uh, fund. And that will necessitate, unfortunately, 
increasing our stormwater charge in the uh, on monthly buildings. Council Member Striegel, you had a comment? Um, well, first, thank you. Um, was there an interfund loan or something? Because I was, uh, I guess, in the back of my head, I thought we were actively working to increase the stormwater account balance. Was there an interfund loan or something that was taken against us, or why is it down? Uh, we have not done any interfund loans. Um, the the fund balance was decreasing, and we and we recognize that we did increase rates beginning in. I believe it was 2017 was our first substantial rate increase. Uh, we have another rate increase that went into effect in 2018, and we do have some rather large capital expenditures for this year. But uh, after the, after 2019, the cash flow projections look much better for this fund. So we do expect the the balance to go up. Uh, whether or not it's going to be adequate for um, stormwater cleanout remains to be seen. But we have taken steps to increase the fund balance. Um, it's just going to be a couple of years before we see that. Thank you. And I guess the expenditures that have been made from that account, um, were any of those like capital expenses that will get, you know, kind of an annuity in terms of use in executing the stormwater? Like I think there was a mini excavator at one point. Did we buy any capital equipment or anything that will get ongoing use? The mini excavator is planned for this year. Okay. And then we're also doing a major um, culvert replacement on um, in the Parkwood neighborhood. So. Okay, but no capital expenses in the past few years, say past five-ish? Well, we did take some money out last year to, to work on across from Chess Lake. Yeah, the Swiss Mountain Pond Dredging yep. Project occurred this winter. We haven't actually paid that bill okay. yet because they haven't sent us one yet, but <laughs> we're working with them on that. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. And then uh, back on the subject of the audit, you know, I there was a lot of conversation around testing. Maybe you could just take a minute to say when you say testing the controls, how does, what does that mean? What does that involve? Um, the testing would be, you know, it could be a number of different areas. We don't go in and do like a, a sample Does test and like test you all the controls. Run a transaction and see if it actually catches any improprieties, or would you? Is it run to see if there's actually compliance to those controls, or what is it you're looking for if you did run a test? Yeah, it would probably just be a, you know, a bigger sample size and. Than what we're we're doing, you know, we're doing more of a a walkthrough to get an understanding and not having a, a sufficient sample size to um, determine that you know this is working in all cases. We're just seeing the smaller, so I think it would just the biggest piece of the testing would be to expand on the sample size. Okay, so you catch the kind of the oddball things mm -hmm. that might. Okay, and then um, those controls that are in place are there state standards or are there guidelines that, you know, because I think it's a more or less state statute that we follow. I think it's always the you know, state that awards the, you know, gives the awards for the financial performance. So do they basically outline what kind of controls should be in place? It's it's not really the state. The, the state auditor does give recommendations um, what kind of internal controls you have in place. There's two frameworks that, um, are out there that one of them, which is COSO, which um, businesses use that. There's one that's called Green Book that's more tailored to, to cities. Most of um, when we go in and do audits of federal awards with our single audits, you know, they're required to, you know, follow one of those frameworks. And we basically base our understanding on, on COSO. And when we're in doing some of those federal awards, that's where we are doing some more of that internal control testing and doing the bigger sample size on those. Okay. So there are some, some guidelines and frameworks out there. And when you're evaluating our controls, anybody's for that matter, are you looking at them relative to those guidelines and saying, you know, whether in general they're consistent and compliant in that way, or how do you, how do you kind of determine adequacy? 
Well, we look in them in the the guidelines of the the coastal guidelines. That's how our audit programs are set up. We also look, you know, we audit um, firm wide, you know, over a hundred cities, around hundred cities. So we you know use that comparison to what we see in other cities too for for internal controls. But the the basic framework is the same in all the audits we do. Okay. So if I could summarize, it sounds to me like. Um, you do testing, but not at a level that would be considered an official test because you do run through the controls and how they would work, but you do it on a smaller sample size. So some of the less common type transactions you may not get in there and therefore there, there could be some, maybe some gaps. Is that? I think that's fair to say that we're, we are doing some testing on them, but we're not doing testing to issue an opinion on them. Right. And then as far as the controls themselves, they are consistent and compliant with the standards, the guidelines provided by the state auditor. And I, I don't know how many years running now we have received the government finance uh, accounting award. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. The, the finance award is more the not necessarily internal controls, but the, how the being in compliance with all the financial reporting standards out there. Okay. Thank you. Council, anything else? Uh, then based on what I've heard, and, and uh, uh, I move that we actually uh, remove Kelly Grinnell's ability to sign checks to increase the uh, separation of duties. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, signify, or, uh, uh, say by, or, I'm sorry, signify by saying nay. No. Nay. No. All right, a uh, motion does not pass on a three to two vote. Cindy, did you get that? Okay, um, do we have to uh, vote on the financial report? Just a point Kelly? of order, I have a question. Why isn't mm -hmm. every time we end up on opposite sides of a vote, you ask Cindy if she got that? Uh, to make sure there's been times when she wasn't sure who second to motion, so on and so forth. Yeah, just interesting how you do that. So that's enough, move on. All right. Uh, Kelly, uh, do we need to uh, approve this? Is there any motion that's required? Um, I think in the past, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. It's probably a good idea to formally um, adopt it. Just be a motion tip. to accept the audit report. Yep. I make right. a motion we accept the uh, audit report as written. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, hearing none, uh, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Derek, you wanted to speak on this item? Name and address for the record, please. This is a late uh, request to speak to item 6A. Uh, Derek Gunderson, 1265 79 and a half Street. Uh, currently serve on Victoria's Finance Committee. Um, some patterns for small organizations came up uh, getting the opportunity to um, read over a few other audits for a few other organizations that I that I help with their finances as well um, it came up specifically uh, with a question for Victoria um, in relating to the size um, so segregation of powers for small organizations whether it's a, a nonprofit or a, a small local government my question is um, are small local governments, small nonprofits, uh, typically, are they typically um, hit with that, with the segregation of powers just noted on the financial report because there's a lack of people to do the job and it's a small department, small number of people, limited segregation of powers? Or is a local government going to be a little bit different I, than a nonprofit? Uh, we finished this item, but I, I, I want. Andy to respond. Can you just use Bob's mic so that you both can be mic'd? Bob, do you mind? I think that's fair to say that you'll, you're going to see that more typically in a smaller organization, whether it's a nonprofit or a city. Because some of the non, smaller nonprofits, which I, our firm works with, I currently don't anymore, but I used to. If they have one person doing all the accounting work, you're most likely going to see that finding in there. Whereas a lot of the smaller cities we work with, and they have very few people in the county, and we'll see that finding in there too. 
Okay, and that that's kind of where I was. I just wanted to see if they were similar because I've seen this um, in other reports. It's just that we are a lean city, and I'd like to make sure we have enough people doing the jobs that we that we have, whether it's finances or uh, you know whatever department it's in, that we have adequate coverage to do the jobs and make the decision that we need to be. Um, so that's uh, what I've had to say, and I appreciate you extending, uh, giving me the courtesy to speak, Mayor and Council. Um, to the to the point all right thank you uh next item uh, uh everybody get up slide down one seat there you have the next item uh 6b downtown uh sidewalk study good evening mayor and council um i'm gonna walk through a couple of slides just to provide some additional background beyond what was included in the staff report um this first slide is a topic that I don't recall that we've had any conversation with the city council about, but the um, city of Victoria is subject to federal law that includes completing a self-evaluation and developing a transition plan um, associated with meeting ADA requirements. So this is something that we've been working on internally for a while now. Um, and we aren't complete yet. We still need to um, finalize the self-evaluation and develop a transition plan, but I did want to just draw this to the council's attention that this is something we're working on. Um, in terms of what's been completed to date, our standards for new constructions, new construction um, remain up to date to be ADA compliant. As MnDOT issues new requirements, we update our standards accordingly. accordingly. Um, we have been working on getting some team members trained in onto these requirements, but then also have specifically on the new construction side required that the um, contractor provide an ADA compliance supervisor who is responsible for making sure that what's getting built complies with current ADA requirements. Um, we've generally, um, throughout the majority of the city, completed an inventory of existing pedestrian ramps, looking at um, all the various requirements associated with um, being ADA compliant to identify which ones are not compliant, which is a large majority of them. Um, and then we replace, we do complete ADA improvements on, as part of our projects. So if we're doing a street reconstruction project or a street rehab project and there are non-compliant pedestrian facilities in the area adjacent to the project, we will work to include those. So that's, that's just been ongoing. Um, but downtown is its own um, interesting set of circumstances. So I just have a couple of different pictures to highlight the issue that we've been dealing with. And the Public Works Department has been slowly trying to work its way through um, completing improvements to the sidewalk facilities um, in the downtown for a number of years now where um, the worst parts of our um, sidewalk system, which I will note includes both the concrete sidewalk and the pavers that abut the sidewalk. Um, some of the most um, significantly deficient situations have been completed um, with Public Works tackling a few areas um, at a time. So as an example, the sidewalk running along the um, parking lot behind Victoria House was replaced. The pavers were in fact in that area just removed in their entirety and um, concrete put back. But I have a couple of photos to show some of the issues that we're seeing really throughout the downtown, existing downtown sidewalk and street skate system. This first picture just shows a pretty typical tripping hazard that you'll have when um, a sidewalk heaves. Um, public works will go through and grind this um, concrete down so you'll notice some areas where it's ground down where it has a better transition. Um, this picture on the bottom is showing over on the Steiger Lake Lane side an ADA compliant pedestrian ramp that was um, replaced as compared to an existing pedestrian ramp um, that doesn't meet current ADA standards and then um, our paver crosswalks that are starting to deteriorate if you Take a look at them. If you drive around at all, you'll start to see that some of those pavers are popping out. Excuse me, Kara, when were those constructed? Um, the 
all these existing downtown streetscape facilities were constructed in 2003. So they're 15 years old. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is my personal favorite because um, you'll find it everywhere if you um, travel about downtown. So the, we have pavers between um, the sidewalk and the back of curb and then also on the back side of the pavers. And a lot of the pavers have settled significantly. So you'll see these, um, you know, divots here that if, if a person were to, um, you know, mosey off the sidewalk, they'd be at risk of falling. This is another um, ped ramp that's not currently ADA compliant, but also has a pretty significant tripping hazard. Um, here's another area where the pavers have settled adjacent to the post office. So these are just a couple of... Actually, there's one other issue that is important to understand on the one on the left. The bike trail is just to the right. Mm -hmm. um, I have really narrow tires on my bicycle. A lot of people do. And that is a hazard that is almost... Yeah. Taking me and another number of other people's out. People There's out. just different examples of that throughout the area and they're all of varying degrees so once public works went through and um, completed all the most the most obvious ones in which to prioritize um, we were sitting there this year trying to figure out where do we go from here what do we do next what's the right repair for a situation like this do we remove the pavers put in new pavers put in grass um, and then our interim city manager came on board and spent some time walking around downtown and said, we, you know, we really got to get this fixed. So the purpose of this study is really preliminary engineering work in order to um, determine what essentially an inventory of everything that exists today, data collection, measuring, um, ADA compliance checks in terms of slopes, uh, maximum slopes, minimum slopes, the consultant would do a fairly rigorous data collection, including using GPS and GIS to inventory all of the infrastructure, um, take measurements, prepare um, results in conformance with MnDOT ADA evaluation standards, but then also develop um, recommendations for how to make repairs, um, detailed planning level cost estimates so we can start figuring out what sort of um, budget would need to exist in order to fix everything that's left. Um, they also identified, this consultant also identified a prioritization of improvements, so they would also issue to us when they look at everything that's there, what's the right order to tackle all of these repairs because, you know, money is not unlimited, so needing to prioritize that work is important. And then they also included an optional task for um, providing us some information about potential funding sources for grant dollars and whatnot to repair some of these things. Um, so the, we solicited um, proposals from three different firms in our pool, two um, submitted, and staff is recommending that Bolton and Mink be selected for the work. Um, for a couple of different reasons. One, they are familiar with the city's downtown standards. They're designing the um, Steiger Lake Lane project, so have been working with us on how we design that streetscape feature to carry through. Um, if it was up to public works and engineering, we'd just rip out the pavers and put a bunch of concrete in, but there is a need to maintain some level of aesthetic associated with the investment in downtown. Um, so including taking a look at that with what their recommendations are. Um, they also had a systematic approach to how they were tackling um, the inventory. We liked their remedial um, toolkit that they would be developing that would theoretically translate to other parts of the city that we would use, um, the prioritization of improvements, and then the funding options um, were included. So with that, um, staff is, recommending that the City Council authorize Bolton and Mink to complete this work. Um, this, I should note that this study was not specifically budgeted for in 2018, um, but staff is recommending that the study be funded using long-term street and maintenance funds. Council? <clears throat> um, I guess my question is, you know, we can identify where there's a 
a lip and some and the pavers need to be reset we can identify ADA compliant or non-compliant um, ramps I'm wondering if the fourteen thousand dollars wouldn't be better served to be put to making those repairs and I mean it's not such a large area that uh, the staff couldn't you know do the survey and um, sort of identify the, the the neediest of them and um, and just work you know put some put a specific dollar amount into um, those upgrades each year for you know whether it's one or two or three years whatever it is and um, do as much work as we can and instead of um, again spending the money on the survey just my two cents worth um, I would note that the ADA evaluation does require some um, level of expertise in order it it's surprisingly complicated how many different criteria going go into evaluating whether it's ADA compliant um, I have one team member on my team who has gone through that certification progress, but um, from a capacity perspective, my team doesn't have the capacity to take this on with the other work that's currently going on in the city. So um, if you and were... You wouldn't just say, okay, we're going to fix that street corner and make sure the engineer that, that um, specified the work, specified the appropriate ADA... Um, it just starts to feel pretty um, overwhelming when you start walking around and you start trying to decide how to prioritize it and what should we do first. What you've described is basically what we have been doing for the last few years. And, um, I, and Anne, I don't know if you want to jump in at all, but it, we're at the point where we need a more comprehensive approach for addressing what's left than doing what that's exactly what we have been doing the last few years, but we've kind of bit off all of those hmm. already. Yeah, Anne, could you sure. kind of add to that, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, good evening, Mayor Council. Um, one of one of the things that that the downtown area has provided challenges with is is not only the, the trip hazards. We've had a couple of them that. Um, have raised some legal concerns. Um, in addition, it is really overwhelming when you start looking at the entire downtown and the pavers. Um, we did a, a small section of concrete from Floyd's just up to the, the parking lot, and it was about $10,000, which we budgeted for. Um, the council had given us $10,000 a year to work downtown. So we've been plucking away at that. Um, and then finding, finding people to actually do the paver work um, We've, we've struggled with some staff turnover in the last couple of years. So um, finding the, the contractors, especially if you're to try to hire, it's expensive. Um, I think we did the one in the front of the post office a couple of years ago, and it was maybe a 10-foot section, and it was $2,500 to, to do, you know, the tiny section. So, um, and they change annually. Well, one will pop you know, this year here and another one will be over here that'll be a significant pop. Um, so chasing those on an annual basis has, has been a struggle from a staffing perspective as well, so. All right, thank you. Yep. Mr. Mayor. Yep, go ahead. I think the other point is, I think you're looking at some serious money that needs to be spent here. You're probably talking hundreds of thousands of dollars that needs to be done. Throwing 10,000 a year is just never gonna get there. I think you need to do a study see what all has to be done, prioritize it, and come up with some money and do it because you've got a lot of deficit there. Council, other comments? I, I just think considering the legal liability of some of these hazards, I think uh, $14,000 is money well spent to have a professional study done. I think so too. Uh, we've got the apartment building, so there's 120 people running around that weren't there before. We. <clears throat> We're bringing more and more people into the downtown area. We say it's a destination. We're happy we have more restaurants. Uh, there's people walk around. We've got a lot of seniors. Uh, it doesn't take much. I've seen people go down, and it doesn't take much to break an arm and, that, and beyond that. So uh, we're playing with fire here if we don't just jump on this. 
All right, I move we authorize Bolton Mink uh, Inc. to provide professional services in an approximate amount of fourteen thousand thirty-eight dollars for the downtown sidewalk slash ADA improvements project. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. Kara, uh, six C Lakeside Drive. <laughs> Um, at the end of the last council meeting, the council requested an update on the Lakeside Drive um, construction. As a reminder, what we're talking about is construction of the missing piece of Lakeside Drive between the Lake Wasserman Woods development and the Lake Town 9th development. Um, included in your packet was a letter to Lennar Corporation from Braun Intertech um, <coughs> outlining their conclusions and recommendations that the surcharge could be removed at this time. Their letter does note that um, we could expect to see additional minor settlement of that three inch type of magnitude in the ten, five to 10 year time frame. Um, so we are looking in, um, ourselves internally and speaking with the um, geotechnical engineer about whether or not any modifications would be recommended in terms of the um, street construction. Based on my initial conversations with um, the consultant and my review of the findings as well as the proposed street improvements, I'm at this point leaning towards not um, recommending any changes to what the proposed construction is. Three inches is relatively minor, and the section of this road is actually has a fairly decent slope to it, so um, even a little bit of settlement wouldn't necessarily create a safety hazard or um, any real big problem. Um, the worst soils are not at the low point of the road, so that's another factor that we look at. Um, that conversation will continue as they're working on the street construction, and I need to review um, that discussion with the Public Works Department, too, to um, get their input. But um, Relative to road construction, the surcharge removal was ongoing. It was nearly gone at last report that I had last week. Um, and then they'll start working on the street construction. They are um, finalizing an outlet control structure that's being um, installed in this area as part of the wetland um, remediation project that Lennar is doing with the watershed district. If you recall, they're doing a wetland remediation instead of um, purchasing wetland credits from a bank. So they're working with the watershed district on some minor modifications to that detail, which um, the pipe needs to go in before the road needs to go in. So you need to make sure that's all correct. Um, but right now we're still uh, moving towards an anticipated open to traffic time frame of early to mid July. All right. Thank you, Kara. Uh, Council, questions, comments? Okay. Uh, next item, uh, CARES uh, 6D. Um, so the uh, agenda item for this has a little bit of additional detail in it, but the um, City of Victoria uses a um, professional services consultant pool for um, engineering, landscape architecture, planning, park design, um, a wide variety of services that are um, completed by consultants outside of city staff. The existing professional services pool was put in place um, in 2012 for a five-year period. So that was 2012 to, through 2017. So with it being 2018, we solicited um, proposals from firms to be considered in the city's pool for 2018 to 2022. Um, the purpose of this pool is essentially to pre-qualify um, consulting firms so that when we come up with a project like the Steiger Lake Lane project, um, we already have a pre-qualified list of firms that we can send our request to proposals for. Two, um, that makes the process more efficient for city staff and for the consultant submitting the proposal. So they don't have to spend a bunch of time putting, submitting information about firm background and what their qualifications are to work in the city. Um, we already have that information. So we're tapping from a pre-qualified list. Um, 23 different firms submitted this time. Um, staff went through and evaluated all the firms in areas such as client manager experience, technical background, 
municipal experience and emphasis on project management. Um, good project management is the key to whether a project is completed on time or on budget. So that is something we always look for in our proposals. So um, based on that review, staff's recommending the firms listed here on the slide be included in the city's pool for 2018 to 2022. Is this just engineering firms? Um, surveyors, surveyors, engineering firms, um, planning, landscape, architecture. Okay, and this doesn't limit us to just these. It just no. makes it easier to use these. Correct. Got it. Uh, council, other comments, questions? Okay. So, this doesn't preclude us from using other firms. No. Which no. I've, I've seen other firms we've used that aren't on this list, but correct. So we have the flexibility to do what we need to do. Correct. This is this this would apply for more of our um, anticipated type projects that are coming up. So, um, as an example, we're gonna um, we have in our budget doing um, some preliminary design work for a future roundabout at the intersection of 1843 and 11. So we'd be looking at firms in this list that have experience in transportation engineering and we would be requesting proposals from them but if the you know if the city had a an example we did get proposals from some firms who do municipal buildings um, but because we didn't have any specific type building projects coming forward we decided to not include any of those firms but certainly would retain those proposals if the city were to undertake some sort of building project in the next five years, they would be people we could contact to start to get proposals from, so. Thank you. Can you put the uh, motion up? Um, if there's no other comments? All right, I move we approve the updated professional service services consultant pool for 2018 through 2022. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, that passes unanimously. Thank you, Kara. Uh, Doug, next item, 6E. Mr. Mayor, the Council and Planning Commission have both talked about the idea of, of adding two alternate uh, delegate uh, Planning Commission members um, and allowing them to actually serve on the Planning Commission in the absence of the regular members. Uh, as we looked into this, we really discovered that we needed to change the ordinance in order to accomplish that. So what we're asking tonight is for you to adopt the ordinance, which uh, sets allows us to uh, you to appoint two new members and then we would after this ordinance takes effect we'd bring the uh, people back and interview the last couple that we haven't talked to yet and uh, let you make appointments of those uh, two members they would only serve when there was somebody absent we would ask them to come to the planning commission meetings um, and if there was a vacancy to take part if not they would not take part unless uh, they were seated in the planning commission Real quick question. I saw in the staff report you listed the number of people missing at various meetings. Is that scattered across all members or is that concentrated in one or two planning commission members? Do you remember? I don't. I, can I defer to it? Yeah, I, I think it was spread to all of them. I think there were some that had more than others. I, that, <laughs> but it wasn't a clear concentration of no. one individual that was having trouble? No. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Council comments. And does this ordinance automatically automatically mean that we have to have two extra? No. If it? if you appoint two, you have two. If you don't, you, you can appoint. It says you okay. may appoint up two. Yes. So okay. All right. With an ordinance, uh, does this require four fifths vote? I don't think so. No. We, Simple majority. Council. No. no. Okay. Um, uh, is there any sort of Requirement I can't remember on a, a, a for an ordinance change to have a public hearing or is it just a straightforward motion just like it is here? Yeah, uh, mayor and council the, the law change that happened last session I believe or the session before was now cities that are proposing ordinance changes or new ordinances have to if they have websites publish on their website 10 days in advance the proposed ordinance make it available, but no, there's no public hearing requirement. There are public hearing requirements specific to zoning code changes so when you make a change to the zoning of a property or the text language of your zoning code that uh, typically requires a public hearing but this kind of language does not okay thank you very much i think we did cindy put this on the website all right so we're good to go then with this all right uh i'm uh unless there's questions i move uh, uh we adopt ordinance 424 an ordinance amending chapter 101 of the victoria city code 
regarding the composition of a planning commission. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Uh, uh, motion passes 4-1. Okay, next item, uh, Doug. Mr. Mayor, we're just simply asking you to discuss tonight the possibility of looking at closing down our compost site uh, at the same time that the county closes down theirs. Um, as you know, we have a very small site. Um, you have a city that's going to get larger and larger and have larger trees and more brush, and that the site that you have now is probably not going to be adequate it's not very adequate now, and it's not going to be very adequate at all as we get larger. So, and there are there are many other options for residents to take their compost to the, the garbage haulers. Uh, most of them have, and we've given you uh, the sites on that have their own um, pickups that the people pay for a small fee, and there are other sites that people can take their their materials to. So, it's our my recommendation that we. Um, consider and we would come back with uh, actual motion at some other at the next meeting probably to um, direct us to not and, and we'd like to put up a sign if we do it uh, to alert everybody that the last time we would do it would be the spring of no it would be this would be the last time that if we did it in January yeah or do we do another one in the fall don't we and so we would have one more in the fall of this year and then that would be the last one so the, uh, uh, I wonder whether or not the residents uh, are fully aware of this and that this is something being considered. And if, uh, if we actually, do we keep it open uh, all through the summer or is there just two time periods when that facility is open? Sorry. Um, uh, and just for the record, I think everybody knows you, but just for the record, your name and position, please. Ann Monkey, Public Works Director. Um, Mr. Mayor, we do keep, the, 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 technically, we are open for a month in the spring and a month in the fall. However, because the site is not secured, people can go whenever they would like and do go wherever they'd like. Um, we have residents, non-residents. We have contractors that will dispose of stuff on the site um, just because it's it's not secured and it's not manned. So we're we're struggling with that piece as well. So and that costs the city money then. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, Ann. The um, I, I'm not opposed to this, but I'm not sure the residents fully are aware. I wonder if we can get a sign out there now to see what kind of feedback we get if people are still using this. Um, and it's if there's commercial businesses that are using this for free and the city's absorbing that cost, I, I don't know if uh, – I'm not real happy with that, but I'm not sure if this is something – do we have any idea what that's actually costing us? Is it a few hundred dollars or is it tens of thousands of dollars? Do we know? I don't know if we, there's even any way to yeah, gauge it's, it. It's really hard to say because there's nobody on site. And unless we catch them by chance, um, you know, we can't make court, uh, contact with them to say, you know, this is site is for residents. Um, I, I don't think it's a huge expense, but okay. it is nonetheless an expense that – we're paying out for contractors to dispose of material. Uh, thank, hang on a second. Just to yeah. make sure I understand this, and for people out that don't use the site, I haven't used it, so I don't have personal experience, but uh, isn't there like dumpsters or somebody comes in and picks it up? It's not dumped there and left there. It's hauled away and recycled in a yard waste Correct. facility? Correct, yes. We, either, either the Public Works employees will, will, depending upon the materials that we have in there, branches will be chipped we'll load trucks and we'll take them and dispose of them. Otherwise, we do have a, a 30 yard dumpster on site that during those peak times, the two times per year, mm -hmm. they will come in and switch out the dumpsters and then, then take it out for recycle. Got it. And this is the facility down in Scott County, I think? Uh, the, um, the, uh, I, I think they're taking it out west. Oh, they're, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. Council? Uh, thank you. Um, I, I wonder if before we move to you know, full closure if we contemplate some measures that might allow us to offer the service without so much of the downside. For example, just, and I understand there's no fence or anything, but just a chain across the road. Simple gate. signage that says, you know, the hours and 
perhaps just a, a simple for a couple hundred bucks buy a Wi-Fi camera that just says video surveillance and don't use it and um, use that as a as a way to try to um, get the warning out and uh, and regulate it so we can maybe find that balance in between. Or if you want to use it, pay us fifty bucks. No, I, so we do we do have a gate across that, and we do shut it at night, generally speaking. Um, but because of how the setup is at the site, people can go right around sure. the mm -hmm. gate. Um, we do have signs up that say when compost is closed, um, closed, and we also do have a, a camera, albeit it may not be a functioning camera, but the surveillance camera that um, we've tried to as well. Um, so, I think we have to look at this uh, somewhat objectively. This is part of our downtown area. It's on the end of it, but it's it's part of the downtown, and we're talking about developing the downtown, you know, eventually extending Steger. Uh, this is an area, this uh, parcel needs to get developed, be part of our downtown. And, you know, it's contaminated, but it needs to be used in some kind of manner that's synergistic with the downtown, not having a dumping site right in the downtown area with those vehicles coming down the street and going through that intersection probably at 79th Street, Highway 5, and Steger, which is a very dangerous intersection. I mean, our, our citizens just uh, poo-pooed a new dump site in almost the same circumstances where uh, it, was, it was heavy traffic, uh, you know, very close to us, that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I can see... There are alternatives. All these people could have their stuff picked up by uh, their waste management people. It might, or there's right. a lot of. I'm sorry. There's a lot of commercial enterprises they yeah, could take or, it to. Also. Yeah, and uh, our citizenry just said they didn't really want a big dumping ground uh, next to us. So I, I mean, I, I have a hard time. We're we're really focusing on the central business district. I have a hard time keeping this open. Um, long term with the idea that we're really serious about uh, getting our central business district developed. So Council Member Vogt raises an interesting point and if, the, if I'm interpreting it the way that he, if I'm, if I'm interpreting it correctly, the way he intended it, there are two questions here. One is um, yard waste and the other is the long term viability of keeping the whole facility open, which raises the question of cold storage and what do you do with all the equipment and stuff like that. But I think both questions merit debate and discussion, and especially in light of um, the redevelopment project that we just approved for Steger Lake Lane. So I, what about the possibility, has it ever been discussed, if this is just a collection point, don't we have enough work, uh, room by the public works to use create a correct co uh, collection point there? Um, in which we could shut down this site? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it, it, the potential exists for that. Um, the, the way that the public works facility was was constructed in the, the end was there was a single drive that actually comes into the site, and maybe, Kara, you can show that. So we've got just a single drive that comes in, um, and then as you move to the east, there's a pretty significant slope um, and we, we ended up creating a, a little bit of a snow storage area um, with a pretty rough drive that our trucks can make for snow storage. Um, but nothing is, is we, it requires some work to do to get a site set up um, at the public works facility. Um, and then trying, I mean, the county has an issue with people coming in and out of their facility. This would be a real challenge as well um, with no turnarounds except going through the, the public works building. Um, on a different but related note, did we, so initially when, when we um, acquired the land and um, built this building, the intent was that at some point in time, a couple of things would happen. Number one was there's a pad built for this building to sort of have a mirror image, so essentially double mm -hmm. in size with the only expense really being the building itself. Um, 
and I don't know, we, we kind of put that as a monitor and decide as, as needed. Um, and then, of course, the existing site, when that is abandoned or shut down, I'm trying to remember if that ends up becoming part of the Three Rivers Park District, if that land is committed to them in some way. I know it has a, a significant bill as the former city dump to, um, to clean it up, to remediate it. It's probably a hazardous fund, hazardous waste super fund kind of thing. Um, I think tires and appliances keep sprouting out of the stream bank at the back of it and right. getting cleaned up every spring. So um, I guess in terms of it being um, part of the downtown redevelopment, you have to cross the regional trail to get to it. So I'm not sure that was the intended use for it after its uh, time as a city asset, um, but it uh, definitely, as the city grows eastward, is not the kind of a bookend we want on our on our city there. So I, I don't disagree one one bit that it needs to be cleaned up, but I'm not sure if it becomes a development site or if it just becomes uh, rehabilitated and becomes parkland. Yeah. And I, and I think that in very preliminary conversations with Three Rivers, that they certainly would likely be interested in it. Um, albeit the city would be required to clean it up um, and remediate any um, hazards that are on the site. Um, in preliminary conversations with the Hennepin Regional Rail Authority, um, there has been no easement granted for the city um, to actually cross the property. Um, we had begun to have that discussion um, prior to the, the new public works building being bought. Um, and at the time, um, of, of discussion about any sort of redevelopment opportunities there, um, I think it would be a real challenge to get a, a trail or a, a crossing easement from Hennepin Regional Rail Authority for that property. So if people are crossing it today, is that that's it's dangerous to the bicycles on the trail and so on and so forth? I, I think it's the vehicle traffic that yeah. they would be concerned about crossing and depending upon what it is in the future. They, it, I think it would be a real challenge for access to be granted besides anybody but a probably a government entity that has limited access to the site. And, and we're crossing it with dump trucks and loaders and various pieces of heavy equipment. As not well. as much anymore. Trucks, yeah, so. not as much anymore, but some. We still have, we still have equipment stored on, on site um, and use it for cold storage. That's city-owned property, isn't it? Correct. Okay. All right, um, Council, what do we want to do here? I, um, I'm inclined to put signs up there, get the camera working, which should be relatively inexpensive, um, and then see what kind of feedback we get. I agree with the comments I heard from council members that long term this is not a viable site. Uh, something will have to be done with it. But in the short term, um, uh, I, I'd like to see the signs put up. Just telling people What huh? would they say? Just to make sure people are aware and see what, if any, feedback we get, um, and then take that into this discussions with the council uh, after we've gotten a chance to see whether or not we get any feedback. So would the sign say this site is going to close on January 1st? Uh, yeah. Let us know what you think? Uh, yeah, let us, let us know. Isn't, um, there a, isn't there a more direct mechanism of communicating that through through our quarterly news updates, things like that? How about, or, or in addition to, I we, we can do both. Or how about something in the, we send everybody a water bill once a quarter. The website? Direct, direct them that way to say, let us know what you think. Yeah. And, and I think that all makes sense. You know, it, it's not an either or. Um, I would suggest that in terms of if we're trying to get compliance, especially out of commercial operators, that they may or may not be Victoria residents and therefore not receiving those communications. So I think some signage at the site um, would be appropriate as well. Well, and correct the camera and put a sign up that once it closes, there's a fine. The, um, so, uh, Doug, I think uh, uh, we don't need a motion this. I think you've heard a lot of the comments. I think the council is in general agreement to look at that. And then um, maybe, um, unless the council objects, uh, think about some of the suggestions as how we could get it out to the residents. 
whether it's in the Victoria Spirit or something in the water bill, okay. one of those mechanisms? So the, 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 what you want to get out is that the city council is considering closing this site for, and we'd like to have your feedback. For it, it, exactly. And, of course, the website is simple and easy. Um, an insert, I imagine, is relatively inexpensive anyway since we have to mail the bills. <clears throat> Um, well, does everybody get uh, hard copy bills, or do we do a lot of electronic bills? I don't know. Uh, the majority of the people get a hard copy bill, but we do have a message section in the utility bill, so I would recommend oh, so putting would it get in it there. there. Okay, perfect. In, the, in that part of the bill. All right. Council, any a question for ahead. the city attorney? If we did decide we wanted to do some kind of a fine, if you know, we tried to keep it open and, and fine or fee for use of... Is that, does that require some sort of an ordinance change, or how would we how would we make sure that that was enforceable? Yeah, uh, Mayor and Council, uh, let me grab at the low hanging fruit there. Uh, the easy answer to give is that yes, at a minimum, it would require that you have an ordinance uh, to impose that kind of a fine. I guess I'm not convinced, as I sit here now, that even that would do it. We'd have to look at that, but at a minimum, you'd have to change your ordinance to provide for that. I mean, obviously, at, at its core, what you're talking about is trespassing, uh, and there are criminal penalties for that, um, albeit modest criminal penalties, but those are not imposed by the city. Those are, you know, through law enforcement. So um, so we'd have to coordinate that. <clears throat> Got it. Um, council, any other comments? No. Uh, Derek, uh, uh, there's been a lot of discussion. You gave me another slip that you wanted. Is there something that we haven't addressed that you want to add to the conversation? Uh, please, uh, they can't hear you at home. Uh, Derek Gunderson, 1265, 79 and a half street. Um, I'm, understand where I live. It's the old, one of the oldest neighborhoods in Victoria. Um, every fall we've got not, you know, some neighborhoods have one, people have one bag. I've got about a hundred bags and then another 25 in the, in the spring. And that's my, that's my issue. I use the city location extensively, but, uh, didn't really matter one way or the other if it gets closed or not because I'll deal with it. But um, I do know that uh, if there are alternatives for older neighborhoods, if we can schedule leaf pickups or something like that for services that we're already paying for through taxes um, that we utilize, different people utilize different services, um, just lo looking at some of the older neighborhoods with more mature trees that do drop two or three times during the fall, looking at alternatives um, to that site um, or the site that they didn't do for the county. Um, I understand we don't want that there. I get it, uh, and I know why we don't want it there. So I just want to make sure that there are alternatives for people that do utilize it a lot um, because then there are also places like two, to, two driveways down from me is an open lot that people, our neighborhood does dump into um, that drains into the pond here, um, which, can't be, which can't be managed. Um, it, nobody really manages pays attention to it so it we get a lot of leaves and a lot of yard waste already going there anyway um and if you haven't seen it um, i'd urge you to come take a look at it mr okay. gunderson brings up an interesting point and prior to city manager um Hokanen's departure she had asked uh, a, i don't want to say it was an offhanded question it was more of a um are you interested in doing something like this? And, and she was looking at different types of services that might be beneficial to the city and what could we do to enhance the service levels, uh, service capabilities. And one of the ideas was, should we sponsor a leaf pickup in the fall and in the spring? Would that be something that the citizens would be interested in? My, my reaction was, you know, I think given the number of trees, some people might be interested in that. Maybe it's something to bring up to see what it would take and that could be a viable alternative to closing this down completely. And I, and I get it. My, my neighborhood's in, a, in the minority in the city. I mean, we've got a lot of new developments with a lot of younger trees. Um, unfortunately, I'm not in that, in that neighborhood. Um, so we do get, we get, uh, we get dropped three times. You rake once, you go back out, you rake the next weekend, and you rake the weekend after that. So um, I'm just, for all options being looked at, um, when the decision is made to finally close that facility down just so that we do have a smooth transition because I don't want to drive all the way to Shakopee to dump my stuff and I don't want to have the other thing is we do have four or five garbage services coming through our neighborhood 
um, adding another environmental truck um, while it, the weight on the roads um, that's one thing Victorians do care about are, are their roads quite a bit so just a heads up on that as well all right thank you Thanks. Uh, um, how, many, how many victorious citizens are using the current site right now do we know have any idea no I no so we we don't even know how many people use it does it does it seem like a lot hmm. well, but we know how many people have leaves yeah, that's see. Yeah, I'm wondering if we can measure disconnect. it in terms of dumpster loads or yeah. something. Uh, that uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, last year we had 38 30 yard dumpsters that were disposed of by our company that we hire to take the, the yard waste away. And my guess is that in addition to that, we probably had another 15 to 20 six yard dump trucks that also went. Um, so you're probably looking at 1,500 yards of yard waste in total throughout the summer. But that also includes um, our people trimming trees. Um, you know, if there's a storm, uh, we will keep the site open for residents as well. But so I know in comparison, if you can... So Derek uh, brought, so up, he brought up a hidden demand here. Yeah. We're building all these new houses that are don't have big trees so I mean this, this is an issue for the future you can't that's you know when you get thousands of homeowners converging on that site in the future sometime conceptually it can't happen really I mean, and, and I think I think Doug may have looked at or something we could also look at is you know what what other like size cities are doing um, as well um, for yard waste disposal to take a look at that. Um, we can look at some other options. Yeah. Sure. All right. Thank you, Ann. Council, any other final comments? All right. Hearing none, Doug, uh, report? I have nothing, Your Honor. Um, Bob? No. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Corley? Reports? Nothing to report. Uh, Council Member Striegel? Uh, thank you. Um, I guess I want to start a conversation. Um, around the, um, the latest article in the Chanhassen Villager uh, by the mayor. Um, if I read this and I didn't know better, fortunately I do, I, I think I would be very alarmed. Um, there is an awful lot of implication of wrongdoing and um, impropriety that simply doesn't exist and I'm well I'll ask I'll just start with the, the letter from uh, uh, wait a second resident. you know what the, this should be put on the agenda so that residents can see that the um, I just received things today from uh, the uh, Doug Reader about this. I don't have any problem uh, uh, talking about it, but it shouldn't be brought up at the end of the meeting in the report section. Why don't we put this as an agenda item so that it can be discussed by the full council, plus where the public knows it's going to be discussed so that we can also prepare for that. Do you have objections to waiting and putting this on the agenda for the next meeting? I um, think it merits reading that. Well, well. yeah, so from, from my perspective, I think, um, yeah, I'll just, I will put it out here as a report and then yes, I think it would be good to come back at it, um, at the next meeting if, if the council agrees, um, and, um, and then we can have a more, I, I, I also am perfectly comfortable having a full council discussion now, but I agree with you that, uh, resident input or at least the ability to see that it's coming is, uh, is a good thing as well. So, um, you know, in the, in the past, the reports were usually intended to be kind of conversation starters to determine if something warranted a, a, a more thorough, you know, being a full agenda item. So with that said, I would like to proceed with my report. Um, and so it's, it starts with a letter from a resident who um, asked a number of questions and I would, I would like to hear the answers to these as well. 
Um, and uh, he states, after reading your article on salary and parking, I have several questions regarding the process you used. Have you published the names of the team of residents who did the review? Uh, and for anyone who didn't read the article, it said that uh, um, uh, a team of residents has been helping me review both policy book provided by the former city manager and comparing that with our city ordinances. So um, his question was, who are those people? Um, and how did, how did you decide who was on this team? Um, did the other council members have input into the team makeup? And I'm, I'm only one, but I'm guessing three out of the five of us can answer that question. Because no, we didn't know it even existed, much less have any input into it. Um, and of course, you know, talking to our constituents and gathering input is always a good idea. Um, that's a whole different scope, though, than a, um, a team of residents who's helping review policy and make recommendations. I think that's wholly inappropriate to do that independently. Um, the resident goes on to ask what city offices and other materials were used. Uh, he asks, did these people get information that is confidential and not normally available? Um, on the subject of salaries, he says, concerning salaries, why are you making the judgments on previous salaries as you are only one person and have only one vote for the future? My point in asking for, the, for answers to these questions is that it appears you are on a vendetta to find things you don't like about the past instead of looking to the future. Because of this vendetta, we have lost excellent employees and have seen the city come to a standstill as you go after the previous administration. Please consider the damage you are doing to Victoria with this vindictive behavior respectfully submitted. And that is the, again, uh, the full contact con, uh, text of an of a email to the mayor um, from, uh, from a resident. Um, and again, I, I understand that um, you're, you're relatively new to the mayor gig here, but you know the the statement about ordinances and the you know compensation, the quote, the compensation of all appointed staff and officers of the city shall be fixed by motion of the city council. Um, I, I'm guessing you know that that is outdated language, and it's um, appropriate to bring that up as a as a as a question for the staff and as a. Um, ensure that if, if it is incorrect that it gets changed. Um, so I'm wondering if the, you know, uh, what the staff advised you when you asked them about that language. Um, and this whole story has kind of a twisting, winding path. And it was, I guess I would say, really surprising to actually see this in print because I think maybe, I don't know, six weeks ago or so, maybe two months ago, the mayor had asked the city manager for uh, a lot of historical data on city salaries, um, stating that he felt that the staff was overpaid. I never said that. And so the, um, you know, the data was gathered. It's just data. It's just numbers. It's facts. It's, you know, it's supportable. Um, and it was distributed to the council, and it showed exactly the opposite. And... Um, and yet the, the city manager then was challenged in terms of his integrity or honesty or, or accuracy. I'm not sure what, but um, so that, that's troubling in and of itself. Um, but what it showed is that actually our staff, you know, and looking at the senior salaries are, are below that of our peer cities. Um, and, you know, the, the time period chosen here is conveniently starts after um, pay raises were again available. We had a period of, I think, at least three years. And maybe I'm looking at you to confirm that. I think eight, nine, ten, and maybe eleven, where zero raises were given to any city employees. I believe. I I don't think we were ever at zero. I think we were at maybe one percent for a few years, but I don't think we were ever actually at flat. And um, so, thank you. Um, I stand corrected. Um, but even so, at the end of 2017, um, salaries 
by and large lagged behind our peer cities. And I think at the time what it showed is that um, good people enjoyed the city, enjoyed working here, and came and gave their best. And were actually willing to work for a little less money because of kind of the whole uh, environment and the, uh, the nature of being here. That's obviously changing dramatically, and, and now we can't even keep people much less um, at, uh, at the kind of rates that we've been uh, enjoying. So um, again, if, if I believed any of this, I would be troubled. Um, and, and again, we'll talk about this in depth at the next meeting, but uh, also the, the comments on parking are just factually incorrect. There's just a whole bunch of broad brush statements that are made that are just flat wrong um, and easily demonstrable. And again, I'm I'm curious what the staff um, had to say when you you know brought this to their attention and asked for their input on the um, on the situation. But we can we can have that conversation at the next meeting. I'm not so sure we should the. Uh Pushing this into the next meeting is something we didn't have as council members, and and I'm sure the staff feels the same way, and past council members, past staff feel the same way. We didn't have any warning. Uh, these comments were put in the newspaper, the Jan Villager, by the mayor, and uh, in vivid print. And this is not the first time. The, there was a, an incident in January when the mayor put in his vision and made comments, ex, you know, like special in, in, interest groups are uh, uh, influencing the council. Comp plan reflects the views of a few and, it, and not the citizenry. There are no policies in, the, in this city. Uh, those kind of statements were made. So there's this, there's this thing going on here in the media where the mayor has license to say these things. Then he says the thing about uh, the salaries and, and the parking uh, out of context and mixed in with factual statements. This is, a, you know, a typical story here where you mix facts with distortions. And, you know, we were given no notice of this. We didn't discuss this in the council before this was put in the newspaper. Now we're talking about having a meeting to discuss this sensibly. Well, the chickens are out of the barn. You know, this, this thing was printed weeks. You know, one of them was printed months ago, and one of these things was printed weeks ago. Uh, this, you know, this to me is, is sickening. It's irresponsible at best from two perspectives. Number one, that it was written and not passed by staff for review and consideration to ensure that it was factual. And then secondly, it was printed without any consideration of whether or not it was factual. Both are uh, the, the So we're going to, uh, right, but this is the reports. You've already passed on your report. We're now discussing this. I'm the coming. public hasn't, you're out of order. Doug, this is I overrule the, the chair. Mayor, no, you're not. out of order. You put this in the newspaper. You put, the chair. You put so downright questions. inaccuracies in the newspaper. One at a time. Yes, and Mr. Crowley was speaking. I appeal the chair. Thank you. I appeal Pop. the chair that, that, that calls for a vote. I appeal the chair. I appeal so, to overrule what you just said. Uh, uh, Second. We're changing the rules. So Okay, fine. No, uh, all, in, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Nay. Mr. Bowes, are we changing the rules in any way, shape, or form? I'm told that we this can. This is supposed to be chair. reports. Reports. And now we're discussions. discussing a brand new item that the public wasn't notified on. Bob? Yeah, Ma Mayor and Council, I don't know what rule, Mayor, you're referring to. Mayor, you're the parliamentarian. I think you ruled the speaker out of order, and that was appealed, and that's been reversed. So I think that's how Robert's world rules works. All right, let's com continue. Go ahead and discuss then. Thank you. Um, I yield to Mr. Vogt. Well, basically, uh, I think any one of us with the, with the facts we have, uh, after thinking about all this and, and doing our own research, we could take every statement the mayor has made in the newspaper and we can refute it to a great degree, if not 100 percent. And, and basically, uh, what is the purpose of this constant nipping at the credibility of 
of the city and the city council and the staff and uh, particularly this focus to the to the to the to the rear to the back instead of really ad addressing the future and staying on tr on track uh, we constantly are confronted with uh, the weaknesses that the city apparently has uh, like the city is sick uh, you know uh, the mayor made the statement in, in January in his vision that we basically had no policies. That's a blatant lie. It, it, but he got away with it. And now he, he puts credit, attacks the credibility of the way we've been uh, giving uh, increases or merit increases to uh, our higher level employees and uh, distorted that completely, uh, distorted the way we've handled the parking. I think this deserves a discussion. We had no uh, notice that this was going to be put in the newspaper. We had no way of confronting it. So uh, why do you bring it up at the reports instead of putting it on the agenda then? Why not? Uh, why not? Since, since so the I'm public the could know? Brought it up. Um, public already knows. They read it. I brought it up because each, each passing day, seems to add another another i don't even know what to call it another insult to the people who have worked here um, in a very committed honest ethical manner and it doesn't seem like any chance to undermine that is passed up um, you know this is in any uh private company um, I think HR would have shown you the door a long time ago. Um, maybe after an HR warning or two about EEOC and hostile work environment and, and bullying, but that's probably not news. Um, as you mentioned, you're very familiar with audits, so I think you are aware of that. And, you know, we put an anti-bullying policy in place to put a stop to this. This is not the way Victoria ever was or ever wants to be council member vote report nothing nothing further council member gregory no report uh, i'll be happy to uh, mayor's report i'll be happy to address the comments from uh, the resident i stand by those statements uh doug i'm going to give you uh after the meeting tonight the policy book i was provided by miss hoken and uh, i'd like that kept out front so any residents that want to come in and see that in addition i'd like you to print out the emails that you sent me confirming uh, uh that the fact that the staff didn't follow the uh, ordinances uh, that you sent to me when i asked you whether or not we'd been complying with the ordinances and then the email you sent me today just late this afternoon saying oh by the way uh, we didn't need to do the parking studies, but make sure you include the the uh, uh, email that says, uh, yes, Mayor, you're right. Uh, we, the uh, developments downtown do need to include uh, parking studies. So I did run these things through. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the details tonight because we didn't notice the public. Uh, I don't have any problem answering those questions, but I want to do it when the public has a, uh, knows that this topic will be on the agenda, and I'll address it at that time. In the meantime, I do stand by that. The other item I'd like to report is uh, I was a member of a group, uh, for those that haven't heard, uh, the Minnesota chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists, a national organization. Uh, uh, the Minnesota chapter selected myself, Ken Goulart, uh, Larry Gooby, along with the attorneys in the lawsuits, and have awarded this group and all of the people that supported us uh, the Peter S. Popovich Award for defending the First Amendment. They specifically selected us in the state and awarded it to us for bringing transparency to uh, Victoria. My articles in the paper are my First Amendment rights to expose what's going on and things that I find after I've researched it. So we'll continue to that discussion uh, when it's an agenda on the council meeting. May I have uh, a question for the, for the city attorney? Proceed. Mr. Vose, um, what happens when city code is counter to um, the plan form of government that the city is operating under? So we have we have an incongruency here where we're a plan B city, and we have a section of the code that was incorrectly or not modified 
when uh, we became a Plan B city. So it, it reflects the process that you should follow from a, if you were not a Plan B city. What happens when that occurs? Well, uh, Mayor and Council, the, the easy, again, the low-hanging fruit, as I said the last time I was asked something, uh, is that uh, we'd be well advised to amend the code, and I think that uh, your, your interim uh, manager intends to do that. Uh, he's working with me on that. <clears throat> as a legal matter, the, again, easy answer is it depends. There are certain provisions of state law that preempt local ordinances, local policies, local regulations, and there are other provisions of state law that don't do that. I've not researched the particular question you're asking, but I'll give you my judgment anyway because you want it tonight. Uh, I, I think with uh, rare exceptions, none of which come to mind right now, uh, to the extent cities are uh, statutory cities and set up as, for example, Plan B city like this city is, the state law governing Plan B cities would apply. Uh, so, but are there examples where cities can have ordinances that are inconsistent with state law and the ordinances will apply? Yes, there are examples of that, but I think on the whole, and I'm happy to look into it further, but I think on the whole, with respect to statutory city authorities, statutory cities have to follow the plan that they are uh, incorporated under, organized under. In the case of Victoria, you changed by vote of the people, by referendum, you changed to a Plan B city not so long ago, and to the extent your code needs to reflect that, um, I think if push came to shove, it's likely that state law would control. Thank you. And Doug, didn't you say in your email to me that uh, uh, nothing's been done since that change occurred in January of 2013 uh, to bring our ordinances in line with a statutory B city? What I told you was that the paragraph that you cited, which says that the city council should approve salaries, was not changed. Right, that's not what I'm asking. The, you stated in an email message to me that uh, uh, our ordinance w were woefully uh, 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 deficient in the sense that they were never adjusted when the city changed to uh, Form B. We can, we can take... That's what I just said. I mean, that, that section was not changed and should have been changed. Right, but, but you implied... Clear, uh, there hang on. Changes made. There were some changes made. Specifically right, but your email out. specifically said to me that there was far reaching changes that need to be made. We'll take this conversation up in the next meeting when it's on the agenda. Uh, we're not going to get into it tonight because uh, the public have every right to know that this is going to be a topic and then we can dig out those emails and people well, we can, can see what I was showing. and discuss it again. The, uh, uh, no, I finished my report. Uh, I move that we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed signify by saying nay. Nay. I'm waiting for two other votes. Nay. Nay. All right, so we're not adjourned. And I voted nay because it didn't seem that there was an effort made to ensure that everybody had been heard. So I think. Um, so is there any further comments? Hearing none, uh, I move that we adjourn. Is there a second? Second the motion. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, all opposed say nay. Hearing none, we are adjourned. <laughs>